Our dear Father in heaven, glory and honor be unto thy name. Thank you again uh, for this privilege of uh, being alive and uh, probation extended unto us that uh, we may be able to exhort one another. And more so as we see the day nearing that, Lord, we may cultivate love for one another. And so help us, Lord, with the work before us that uh, you who is uh, uh, the qualifier of uh, the laborers to work in thy field, may you send forth laborers that they may do thy work in such a time as this, that, Father, the stuttering had angels' message may at least awake and thy work be done now and forevermore. We pray that um, you be with us and guide us. Give us of thy spirit and uh, fill us with thy holy presence in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, blessings to all and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. This is uh, our number 22 in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers, An Appeal to Common Sense, Part 10. We are coming to an end of this, An Appeal to Common Sense in some few presentations, maybe two. And uh, today we are going to look uh, at this number 22, In Temperance in Working, Case Study of uh, James White. And so uh, I'd like to welcome all of us that uh, we may be at Jesus' feet as we continue learning these messages together. Be before I speak about um, uh, the issue of uh, intemperance and temperance, I'll just like to say that uh, with the work of the third angel before us, it is when you look uh, at the church, it's like that this message will never go on. And the reason being, there's a lot of disunity, there's a lot of quarreling, there's just a lot of murmuring in that uh, the upper room experience, it seems it will never happen again. And uh, this is the doing of the enemy of souls so that... Um, there may be a slackening and a lax and lack of zeal for the work of God so that uh, he may make sure that there will be no another revival or another wake awakening. Uh, and due to this uh, rolling third angel's message, there are some who have thrown themselves in the field to finish up the work, which is a good thing. But then something has been neglected. As you, you, you know, the history repeats itself. And uh, in uh, some of uh, Ijiwat writings, she says, God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves, which they should not leave for God to do for them. Lustful appetite makes slaves of men and women and because their intellect and stupefies their moral sensibilities to such a degree that the sacred elevated truth of God's word are not appreciated. And uh, in order to be fitted for translation, the people of God must know themselves. They should ever have the appetite in subjection to the moral and intellectual organs. But that is not the only thing per se that is happening. We have um, a a diagnosis that uh, we have refused to accept. And uh, that diagnosis is that we are in Laodicean condition. The reason why God has not worked among us so much is that uh, we have refused our, diag our, our diagnosis. And uh, talking about refusing our diagnosis, I, I want to read a statement in Jeremiah chapter 3 because we talk about the latter rain Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 3. Why is uh, the latter rain with hail, and why are the showers not falling, and why can the people of God do the work that they should be doing? In 
Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 3 we are told there for the showers have been withholden and there hath been no latter rain and thou hadst a woe's forehead thou refusest to be ashamed and what does it mean we refuse to be ashamed we refuse to acknowledge our true condition and what we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be doing and so there is nothing really god can do for us if we refuse the right diagnosis of our condition another thing is uh, i believe in one sm why these messages are not going as they should be going i believe one sm um uh I'll just give you a page uh now uh hold on the trials and um the attitude trials and the attitude of the children of israel al Now, in uh, in one SM, page four hundred and six, paragraph one. This is uh, what we are told. We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles. in me when i think of what a for we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him the trials of the children of israel and their attitude just before the first coming of christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of god in their experience before the second coming of christ how the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the jews and today he is seeking to blind the minds of god's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth and uh, what is this precious truth the right diagnosis of our condition accepting it and accepting jesus christ to work on it but uh, that aside linked with that is people who have seen that this message must go and they have thrown themselves to the field and they are doing everything they can do to make sure the message goes but then um they have negated the health message which is temperance in all things and some are dying some are sickly although they have a zeal for the work of god but the work is so much and they are alone and um, they have not had time to rest so that uh, they may be rejuvenated and uh, revived and revitalized so as they be able to go to the field and this is the issue i want to talk about uh, a need for temperance in all things and what the workers are advised even so even though the work is much and so without uh, just uh uh going into much i, I want us to look at uh, in temperance in work in a case study of james white now i'll be reading from the christian service from page uh, 247 and uh, i know that uh, this will bless us would well, that every child of god might be impressed with the necessity of being temperate in his eating dressing and working that uh, he may do the best work for the cause of god when uh, when the laborer has been under a pressure of um uh, when um I, I, i'll do it again would that every child of god might be impressed with the necessity of being temperate in his eating dressing and working that he may do the best work for the cause of god when the laborer has been under a pressure of work and care and is overworked in mind and body he should turn aside and rest a while 
not for selfish gratification, but that he may be better prepared for future duties. We have a vigilant foe who is ever upon our track to take advantage of every weakness that he may make his temptations effective for evil. When the mind is overstrained and the body enfeebled, he can take advantage and press the soul with his fear assist temptation that he may cause the downfall of the child of God. Let the laborer for God carefully husband his strength and when wearied with the toil that must come upon him, let him turn aside and rest and commune with Jesus. Revealed Herald 14, 1893. The misuse of our physical, the misuse of our physical powers, the misuse of our physical powers shortens the period of time in which our lives can be used for the glory of God. The misuse of our physical powers shortens the period of time in which our lives can be used for the glory of God. And it unfits us to accomplish the work God has given us to do. By allowing ourselves to form wrong habits, by keeping late hours, by gratifying appetite at the expense of health, we lay the foundation for feebleness. By neglecting physical exercise, by overworking mind or body, we unbalance the nervous system. Those who thus shorten their lives and fit themselves for the service, for service by disregarding nature's laws, uh, are guilty of robbery toward God. And they are robbing their fellow men also. The opportunity of blessing others, the very work for which God sent them into the world, has by their own course of action been cut short. And they have unfitted themselves to do even that which in, in a briefer period of time they might have accomplished. The Lord holds us guilty when by our injurious habits we thus deprive the world of good. And that means... When we overwork ourselves and die, we have deprived of the world of good. Or when we overwork ourselves and then we get so tired and sick and we can go to work, then we deprive the world of the benefit they should be uh, getting. Again, our God is ever merciful, full of compassion and reasonable in all his requirements. He does not require that we shall pursue a course of action that will result in the loss of our health or the enfeeblement of our power of mind. He will not have us work under pressure and strain until exhaustion follows and prostration of the nerves. The Lord has given us a reason, and he expects that we shall exercise reason and act in harmony with the laws of life implanted within us, obeying them that we may have a well-balanced organization. Day follows day, and each day brings its responsibilities and duties. But the work of tomorrow must not be crowded into today. The workers in the course of God should feel how sacred is it is character. And they should prepare themselves for tomorrow's work by a judicious employment of their powers today. CHS 248.2 Now, as a rule, the labor of the day should not be prolonged into the evening. I have been shown that those who do this often lose much more than they can gain. For their energies are exhausted and they labor on nervous excitement. They may not realize any immediate injury, but they are surely undermining their constitution. Child Guidance, page 397.2. Again, in Child Guidance, um, in, in the same Child Guidance, page 397, paragraph 3. To those who make great exertions to accomplish just so much work in a given time, and continue to labor when their judgment tells them they should rest and never gain us. They are leaving a borrowed capital. They are expending the vital force which they will need at a future time. And when the energy they have so recklessly used is demanded, they fail for want of it. The physical strength is gone. The mental powers fail. They realize that they have met with a loss but do not know what it is. Their time of need has come but their physical resources are exhausted everyone who violates the laws of health must sometime be a sufferer to a greater or lesser less degree god has provided us with constitutional force which will be needed at different periods of our lives if we recklessly exhaust this force by continual over taxation we shall sometime be the losers in uh, 
my relations to this course i have been longest i have been longest and most closely connected with the publishing work three times have i fallen stricken with paralysis through my devotion to this branch of the course now that God has given me renewed physical and mental strength, I feel that I can serve his cause as I have never been able to serve it before. I must see the publishing work prosper. It is interwoven with my every my very existence. If I forget the interest of this work, let my right hand forget um, Kani. And so, again, she instructs, we had an appointment to attend a, to attend a attend meeting at Charlotte Sabbath and Sunday, July 23 and 24. This is from 1T107.2. As I was in feeble health, we decided to travel by private conveyance. On the way, my husband seemed cheerful, yet a feeling of solemnity rested upon him. He repeatedly praised the Lord for mercies and blessings received and freely expressed his own feelings concerning the past and the future. The Lord is good and greatly to be praised, he said. He is a present help in time of need. The future seems cloudy and uncertain, but the Lord will not have us distressed over these things. When trouble comes, he will give us grace to endure it. What the Lord has been to us and what he has done for us should make us so grateful that we will never murmur or complain. Our labors, burdens, and sacrifices will never be fully appreciated by all. I see that I have lost my peace of mind and the blessing of God by permitting myself to be troubled by these things. Remember, we are dealing with the temperance in all things, a case study of James White, and we are looking at the issue of uh, workers forfeiting their vitality by overtaxing and overworking, thinking that uh, in doing that, they can better hurry the third angel's message. Sister White, this cannot be so. The work for tomorrow should not be overcrowded today. And those who know that they have been called to labor must have time to rest, lest they die or they be stricken with the disease and the world is robbed of the talents and the benefits that the Lord had needed to be given through them. And so as we see the third angel's message crawling and we have a zeal to make it run, let us remember one thing that God has appointed us a work and we cannot improve on his methods. The, um, the news that we recommend to sick people should just be used by also healthy people. The new start is not for the sick people alone. It is also for the people who are healthy so that they may continue to be healthy. For if we do not consider it, we enter into sickness and we rob the world of our labors. Right now, there are very few laborers in the field and we cannot afford to lose any of them because they are overworking or overtaxing themselves and then the world be robbed of one more worker. And so an appeal to common sense that we are not even by overtaxing ourselves going to finish the work. It has seemed hard to me that my motives should be misjudged and that my best efforts to help, encourage, and strengthen my brethren should gain and again be turned against me. But I should have remembered Jesus and his disappointments. His soul was grieved that he was not appreciated by those he came to bless. I should have dwelt upon the mercy and loving kindness of God, praising him more and complaining less of ingratitude of my brethren. Had I ever left all my perplexities with the Lord, thinking less of what others said and did against me, I should have had more peace and joy. This is Sister White talking about what James White was now saying. I will not seek first to guard myself that I offend not in word or deed, and then to help my brethren make straight paths for their feet. I'll not stop to mourn over any wrong done to me. I have expected more of men than I ought. I love God and his work, and I love my brethren also. Why was James, why was James White talking like this? It is because the work that had to be done with five men was being done by him alone in the publishing house and in other offices. And so here he's talking about how he has been perplexed, overtaxed, and now he is sick. And he is relating this incident to E.G. White herself, how now he is feeling. And at this point, it is when he started to be sickling and had strokes and 
eventually died and E.G. White was shown that James White died of exhaustion. His system shut up because he overtaxed himself. So what did the church benefit by him dying? Nothing. What will it benefit for any worker dying? Nothing will it benefit. Um, we read on. Little did I think as we travel on that this was the last journey we would ever make together with E.G. White. This is James White talking. Uh, this is now Sister White talking. Uh, after relating what James White had, was telling her, now she says, Little did I think as we travel on that this was the last journey we would ever make together. The weather changed suddenly from oppressive heat to chilling cold. My husband took cold but though thought his health so good that he would receive no permanent injury. He labored in the meetings at Charlotte, presenting the truth with great clearness and power. He spoke of the pleasure he felt in addressing a people who manifested so deep an interest in the subjects most dear to him. The Lord has indeed refreshed my soul, he said, this is James White. While I have been breaking to others the bread of life, all over Michigan, the people are calling eagerly for help. How I long to comfort, encourage, and strengthen them with the precious truth applicable to this time. Now, Sister White says, for years previous to my husband's dangerous and protracted illness, he performed more labor than two men should have done in the same time. He saw no time when he could be relieved from the pressure of care and obtain mental and physical rest. Through the testimonies, he was warned of his danger. I was shown that he was doing too much brain labor. I will here copy a written testimony given as far back as August 26 in 1855. She says, notwithstanding the labors, cares, and responsibilities with which my husband's life had been crowded, his 60th year found him active and vigorous in mind and body. Three times had he fallen under stroke of paralysis, yet by the blessing of God, a naturally strong constitution and strict attention to the laws of health, he had been enabled to rally. Again, he traveled, preached, and wrote with his wounded zeal and energy. Side by side, we had labored in the cause of Christ for 36 years, and we hoped that we might stand together to witness the triumphant close. But such was not the will of God. The chosen protector of my youth, the companion of my life, the sharer of my labors and affliction has been taken from my side, and I am left to finish my work and to fight the battle alone. She goes ahead to say in 1T 106.1, the spring of early summer of 1881, we spent together at our home in Battle Creek. My husband hoped to arrange his business so that we could go to the Pacific coast and devote ourselves to writing. He felt that we had uh, made a mistake in allowing the upper and ones of the course and the entreaties of our brethren to urge us into active labor in preaching when we should have been writing. My husband desired to present more fully the glorious subject of redemption, and I had long contemplated the preparation of important books. We both felt that while our mental powers were unimpaired, we should complete these works, that it was a duty which we owe to ourselves and to the cause of God to rest from the heat of battle and give to our people the precious light of truth which God had opened to our minds. Some weeks before the death of my husband, I urged upon him the importance of seeking a field of labor where we would be released from the burdens necessarily coming upon us at Battle Creek. In reply, he spoke of various matters which required attention before we could leave, duties which someone must do. Then, with deep feeling, he inquired, where are the men to do this work? Where are those who will have an unselfish interest in our institutions and who will stand for the right, unaffected by any influence with which they may come in contact? And that is still the question today. Where are the men to help other men to do the work? And there are not only being sought men, but unselfish men who are not really driven by uh, uh, um, benefits uh, because of the work, but who are zealous to do the work with little benefits that may be there. And so 
James White finds himself in a situation where there is a work to be done and no one is to do it. And this is not because the brethren were not there, but brethren were there, but they were few. And the others who were there, they were dead logs. They were not doing something. And this is something that uh, many of us should consider. In the field of work we are in, are we dead logs? Letting others overtax their brain and overwork and unexpectedly be removed by sickness or uh, loss of vitality and then they die off. What are we doing as uh, those who have presented ourselves as laborers in the cause of God? And then uh, she continues to say, with the tears, this is James White, he expressed his anxiety of our institutions at Battle Creek. Said he, my life has been given to the upbuilding of these institutions. It seems like death to leave them. They are as my children, and I cannot separate my interest from them. These institutions are, low, are the Lord's instrumentalities to do a specific work. Satan seeks to hinder and defeat every means by which the Lord is working for the salvation of men. If the great adversary can mold this institution according to the world's standard, his object is gain. It is my greatest anxiety to have the right man in the right place. If those who stand in responsible positions are weak in moral power and vacillating in principle, inclined to lead toward the world, there are enough who will be led. Evil influences must be must prevail, must not prevail. I would rather die than live to see this institution mismanaged or turned aside from the purpose for which they were brought into existence. And that is what it happened. He died. James White, since 1844, had been doing the work of several men. By the time he was 44, he was worn out. He had carried the burden of financial accountability when others were slow to contribute. He had almost single-handedly led a scattered flock into becoming an organized church with doctrinal unity and common goal. His pen had become a remarkable expositor of clear gospel teachings, and he was a constant source of encouragement and vision for others, but he did not know how to rest nor was he tempered in his eating habits. And you understand because of uh, the strokes that he was having. On August 16, 1865, he suffered his first stroke after a week of unusual stress and little sleep. He was mentally and physically exhausted, virtually incapacitated. Realizing that emergency procedures were needed when he failed to respond to home rest, Ellen White remembered that her health reform principles included a special emphasis on hydrotherapy, but she did not know how this principle would work out in practice, especially for such a serious problem as her husband's. So, in late September 1865, she took James White to our home, that is a health institute at Danceville, New York, that emphasized, um, emphasized hydro hydropathic treatments and other medical practices that involve natural methods rather than conventional drug therapy. In Spalding and Magan 258.2, we read, why do not our physicians see and understand that patients should be treated out of and away from the cities? And not the patients only, but physicians and nurses need a cheerful sunshine atmosphere. Is it surprising that under gloomy surroundings, workers should be downhearted and depressed leading unbelievers to think that their religion makes them gloomy. Let there be light and love and cheerful song in the place of gloom and what a change will take place. Now, what was James White missing? A cheerful surrounding and an atmosphere and um, a heart that uh, had joy in it. We understand that a merry heart worketh like a medicine. And this he was missing because of the burdens that uh, he was carrying. And so this was missing in his breast and uh, this really uh, um, this really speedified his demise. In reflecting on this decision, especially when some church members thought they were not fully trusting James to God in prayer, Ellen White wrote, while we did not feel like despising the means God 
had placed in our reach for the recovery of health, we felt that God was above all, and he who provided water as his agent would have us use it to assist abused nature, to assist abused nature to recover her exhausted energies. We believe that God would bless the efforts we were making in the direction of health. We did not doubt that God would work a miracle and in a moment restore to health and vigor. But should we do this, would we not be in danger of again transgressing, abusing our strength by prolonged intemperate labor and bringing upon ourselves even worse condition of things? And this is recorded by Herbert Douglas uh, in the book, uh, The Messenger of the Lord, uh, page uh, 301, paragraph 2. To 301 paragraph 5. In paragraph 3, he says, Overheated lecture hall seriously affected James' head. Fresh air was needed at all times for clear thinking as well as for physical comfort, and he didn't have this. While experiencing severe mood swings and singing hope, many prayer sessions through the days and nights provided James with the peace of mind that led to uh, him having some sleep. While in family worship, Christmas Day, December 25, 1865, Ellen White was taken off in vision. This vision runs with Otsiego, Ots vision of June 8, 1863, in unfolding the significance of health reform within the Third Angels message. The Oswego vision opened up the integrated system of health principles that the Lord wanted the Adventist Church to adopt. The Rochester vision emphasized how feeble had been the response of most church members and gave even more explicit information as to how the church was to coordinate health reform with the gospel message. Ellen White wrote out the vision the next day and gave the document to James. For months, they had been wondering why they had seen no progress in his recovery. They now knew why and what they must do about it. And what was the reason he was not having some good health? He was over-laboring and not taking heed to the uh, new start uh, 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 recommendation. James had let fear and anxiety overwhelm his faith and that by the power of his will and trusting in God's power, he will regain his health. The sick are to be taught that it is wrong to suspend all physical labor in order to regain health. And so um, the, 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 they were able uh, to bring him to an institution that uh, was to care for him. But uh, due to the work that uh, was increasing again, uh, he continued to work and work and work. And uh, the few that were working in the health uh, institute also, they were overburdened with work. And some of the people who were working in the publishing houses became sick because the work was so much but few men were doing the work now uh looking at the case of james white uh looking at uh, at james white and reflecting everything that was happening she she had some things to speak on uh, health reform. She had something uh, she had to speak about health reform. Uh, one of the problems that had developed in Battle Creek was the extremism fostered by uh, people who are working in health reform. And uh, some of them advocated the, discontinuan the discontinuance of salt, sugar, milk, butter, and eggs. The extreme caused confusion and loss of subscription. When Ellen White returned from her West Coast camp meeting assignment, she saw why the health reformer was about um, to die. And uh, these things were giving anxiety to James White. Now, why were these things giving anxiety to James White? Remember, this is a man who had invested all his money in Adventist institutions. Not that he may gain back money, but he may see the crawling work of the third angel's message going hither and thither. And so it was a hard time to, for E.G. White herself to make sure that these institutions were being run, 
and at the same time make sure that the husband was recovering for the sickness of the husband was linked to the failing of this institution and so think about it when it is um, a time for the wife to exercise more faith than the husband and so it was tasking ta uh, tasking so much and uh, at the end uh things did not go well and uh the 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 health of James White continued to deteriorate time by time and so um i want just to look at some things that uh had to happen at uh, at the end of uh, his life and what he had to cancel uh, the gospel workers. The, the counsel she had to give the, the, the Bible workers after um, the, the death of uh, the husband. In that um, there was a lot of um, calling of ministers in meetings and meetings after meetings. And uh, I, I want just to bring something here where actually she speaks about um, the, the position of the ministers. What are they supposed to do and what are they not supposed to do? Going to the life of the ministers in gospel order, seeing that James White died of over taxation. And uh, just allow me, ministers. gospel ministers and uh, administrative work now allow me to share this after james white's uh uh death there are some things that eg white was shown uh, about ministers and uh, how they should uh, work things out. She said, I have been instructed in regard to the importance of our ministers keeping free from responsibilities that should be largely borne by businessmen. And this is ministers and business matters. And why is she saying that we are looking at intemperance of gospel workers, not in eating, but overtaxing their brains and not having a time to rest so that they may be refreshed and go to the field to do their work, an appeal to common sense. And it is, we are told that by overtaxing ourselves, we die early and we rob the world of the benefits that they could have gained if we were alive. And that death does not result because God has uh, a scene that it's a time for us to rest, but because our vital power have been overused. And he says that this is recorded as robbery to God. When we fall sick because of overtaxation and the world is deprived of our services, everything needs to be balanced. And she says the work of tomorrow should not be crowded today. And so, after the husband died, she had to cancel ministers not to be attending many business matters. I have been instructed in regard to the importance of ministers keeping free from responsibilities that should be largely borne by businessmen. In the night season, I was in an assembly consisting of a number of our brethren who bear the burden of the work. They were deeply perplexed over financial affairs and were consulting as to how the work 
who will be managed most successfully. Some thought that the number of workers might be, might be limited, and yet all the results essential be realized. One of the brethren occupying a position of responsibility was explaining his plans and stating what he desired to see accomplished. Several others presented matters of consideration. Then one of dignity and authority arose and proceeded to state principles for our guidance. To several ministers, the speaker said, this is the guiding angel. Your work is not the management of financial matters. It is not wise for you to undertake this. God has burdens for you to bear. But if you carry lines of work for which you are not adapted, your efforts in presenting the word will prove unsuccessful. This will bring upon you discouragement that will disqualify you for the very work you should do. A work requiring careful discrimination and sound and selfish judgment. This is gospel workers page 422 downward. Those who are employed to write and to speak the word should attend fewer committee meetings. They should entrust many minor matters to men of business ability and thus avoid being kept on a constant strain that robs the mind of it is natural vigor. They should give far, far more attention to the preservation of physical health for vigor of mind depends largely upon vigor of body. Proper periods of sleep and rest and an abundance of physical exercise are essential to health of body and mind. To rob nature of her hours for rest and recuperation by allowing man, one man to do the work of four or for three or even of two will result in inseparable loss. And remember, this is what killed James White. Education in business lines. Those who think that a man's fitness for a certain position qualifies him to fill several other positions are liable to make mistakes when planning for the advancement of the work. They are liable to place upon one the cares and burdens that should be divided among several. Experience is of great value. The Lord desires to have men of intelligence connected with his, with his work, men qualified for various positions of trust in our conferences and institutions. Especially our consecrated businessmen needed, men who will carry the principles of truth into every business transaction. Those placed in charge of financial affairs should not assume other burdens, burdens that they are incapable of bearing, nor is the business management to be entrusted to incompetent men. Those in charge of the work have erred sometimes in permitting the appointment of men devoid of tact and ability to manage important financial interests. Now, Men of promise in business line should develop and perfect their talents by most thorough study and training. They should be encouraged to place themselves where, as students, they can rapidly gain a knowledge of right business principles and methods. Not one businessman can now can not one business man now connected with the course needs to be a novice. Now, right principles essential. Those who labor in business land should take every precaution against falling into error through wrong principles of methods. Wrong principles or methods. Their record may be like that of Daniel in the courts of Babylon, when all his business transactions were subjected to the closest scrutiny. Not one faulty item could be found. So the, the issue is that uh, there should be no crowding of labor to one person, a labor that can be divided among other workers. Again, at this time, God's cause is in need of men and women who possess rare qualifications and good administrative powers. Men and women who will make patient, thorough investigation of the needs of the work in various fields, those who have a large capacity for work, those who possess warm and kind hearts, cool heads, sound sense, and unbiased judgment, those who are sanctified by the Spirit of God and can fearlessly say no or yeah and amen to to position, those who have strong convictions, clear understanding, and pure sympathetic hearts, those who practice the words, only are brethren, Matthew 23, 8, those who strive to uplift and restore fallen humanity, gospel workers, 424.2, work for ministers, and now she goes ahead to define what is the work of the ministers. Not a few ministers are neglecting the very work that they have been appointed to do. Why are those who are set apart for the work of the ministry placed on committees and boards? 
Why are they called upon to attend so many business meetings, many times at great distance from their fields of labor? Why are not business matters placed in the hands of businessmen? The ministers have not been set apart to do this work. The finances of the course are to be managed by men of ability, but ministers are set apart for another line of work. Gospel Workers, page 425, paragraph 1. Ministers are not to be called hither and thither to attend board meetings for the purpose of deciding common business questions. Many of our ministers have done this work in the past, but it is not the work in which the Lord wishes them to engage. Too many financial burdens have been placed on them. When they try to carry the burdens, they neglect to fulfill the gospel commission. God looks upon this as a dishonor to his name. And so what should be the care for the workers then? Some provision should be made for the care of ministers and other, others of God's faithful servant who through exposure or overwork in his cause have become ill and need rest and restoration. Or who through age or loss of health are no longer able to bear the burden and heat of the day. Ministers are often appointed to a field of labor that they know will be detrimental to their health. But unwilling to shun trying places, they venture, hoping to be a help and blessing to the people. After time, they find their health failing. A change of climate and of work is tried without bringing relief. And then what are they to do? The faithful laborers who for Christ's sake have given up worldly prospects, choosing poverty rather than pleasure or riches, who forgetful of self, have labored earnestly to win souls to Christ, who have given liberally to advance various enterprises in the cause of God, and have then sunk down in the battle, wearied and ill, and with no means of support, must not be left to struggle on in poverty and suffering, or to feel that they are paupers when sickness or infirmity comes upon them. Let not our workers be burdened with the anxious Query, what will become of my wife and little ones now that I can no longer labor and supply their necessities? It is but just that provision be made to meet the needs of these faithful laborers and the needs of those who are dependent on them. Gospel Workers 426.2 Generous provision is made for veterans who have fought for their country. These men bear the scars and lifelong infirmities that tell of their perilous conflict their forced marches, their exposure to storms, their suffering in prison. All these evidences of their loyalty and self-sacrifice give them a just claim upon the nation where, where nation they had have helped to save, a claim that is recognized and honored. But what provision have Seventh-day Adventists made for the soldiers of Christ? We are told, our people have not felt as they should the necessity of this matter and it has therefore been neglected. The churches have been thoughtless, and though the light of the word of God has been shining upon their pathway, they have neglected the most sacred duty. The Lord is greatly displeased with this neglect of these faithful servants. Our people should be as willing to assist these persons when in adverse circumstances as they have been to accept their means and services when in help. God has laid upon as the obligation of giving special attention to the poor among us. But these ministers and workers are not to be ranked with the poor. They have laid up for themselves a treasure in the heaven that faileth not. They have served the conference in its necessity, and now the conference is to serve them. Gospel Workers 427, paragraph 3. When cases of this kind come before us, we are not to pass by on the other side. We are not to say, be warmed and filled, James 2.16, and then take no active measures to supply their necessities. This has been done in the past, and thus in some cases, Seventh-day Adventists have dishonored their profession of faith and have given the world opportunity to reproach the cause of God. It is now the duty of God's people to roll back this reproach by providing these servants of God with comfortable homes, with a few acres of land on which they can raise their own produce and feel that they are not dependent on the charities of their brethren. With what pleasure and peace would these worn laborers look to a quiet little home where their just claims to it is raised will be recognized? So there are people who have felt the necessity of the work to be done. And they have thrown their energies into the field because the laborers were few. And now they are sick. And we know that 
this is uh, 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 the sickness has been caused by their overtaxation of brain and vital powers. And they didn't do it because they wanted it. And we know that uh, they threw themselves to the uh, uh, field because of uh, the want of the work there. When they become sick, we are told, even though they have brought to themselves sickness and God will know how to deal with them, we are not to be thoughtless of their case and say, who, 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 who sent you there? They went there because they had the zeal for the crawling work of the third angel's message. And now they are in that condition, we are told, the church should not be thoughtless to neglect them. They should make sure that they recover their health. And when their health is recovered, let them follow the health principles because one man will never finish the work. And one way to make them have rest or to make them not break the loss of health is not to be calling them in board meetings after board meetings and even far and sending them to extreme places where we know the change of climate can affect them adversely. And so as we bring this to an end, what does um, Sister White advise uh, gospel workers? What does she advise gospel workers? I just want to look at uh, uh, something small here and then uh, uh, we, we finish. Uh, I'll read from uh, letter 53, 1876. Letter 53, 1876. She says, How many sinners have gone down to their graves in darkness who might have been warned if ministers had preserved health by strictly living in accordance with the light God has given them in regard to the treatment of their own bodies? Sometimes, as ministers, we don't get rest till God withdraws his presence and we get sick and then we can't work, which is sin. The idea of expecting ministers to be on a field always without rest, making them break the laws of health is sin. Now, she talks about Edison working for wages at the expense of religious welfare, but I'll skip over that and go on overworking the brain leads to mental breakdown and eventually death. Take time off from thinking and give your brain a holiday. She says, Dr. Dio Lewis talked out his peculiar case to us freely. He has been business surfeited until he is in danger of losing the balance and control of his mind. And uh, yes. If business is mentioned to him, he says he becomes irritated and provoked. But on every other subject, he's all right. I thought of your father, that is James White. And now Sister White is talking to his son, Edison. I thought of your father. His case is similar, similar to what Dr. Lee Dio Lewis. There are some things, actually, during the time, just time prior to his passing away, James White was a very irritable person. And uh, he could, when he could hear some things, he could overreact over them. And so here, E.G. White is telling the son, Edison, I remember of your father. He overworked, overtaxed his brain until some things he could not want to hear mm, about them. And so here we have Dr. Dio also going through the same overtaxation of the body. Uh, I thought his case is similar. This, she says, this is nothing more or less than mental infirmity. Dr. Lewis says he can lecture with perfect ease from one to three hours every day. He can discuss, he can dictate to write with perfect ease, but it is deplorable, said he, that I am going all to pieces. The organs that are called into exercise by thought on business matters are, are so irritated. I get mad 50 times a day at the most simple question asked me in the kindest manner. This is Dr. Dio Lewis speaking. This infamy, uh, this is Sita White responding to what Dr. Uh, Dio Lewis had said. This infirmity is growing upon me and I am compelled to make a change. I shall go to the Pacific coast and have a change. 
many dying of overworking many dying of overworking uh, this is letter 114 1890 paragraph 13 or that the work will be taken up by a larger number who will consecrate soul body and spirit to the lord's vineyard so that a few will not work themselves to death because so many are idling I was shown that Sabbath keepers as a people labor too hard without allowing themselves change or periods of rest. Recreation is needful to those who are engaged in physical labor and still more essential for those who labor, whose labor is principally mental. It is not essential to our salvation nor for the glory of God to keep the mind laboring constantly and excessively even upon religious themes. So even if you say that I'm doing religious duties, he says it is not to the glory of God because you are going to die. Now, need for Bible workers rest. This is the last thing I'm reading here. Brother Olsen, put down the brakes. Give yourself periods of rest and you will go forth fresh to endure another strain. But work less. For the sake of Christ who has bought you, work less. You have no right to draw from the bank until the last farthing is withdrawn. Leave a deposit, my brother. If the example of men you mention, if the example of the men you mention, laborers for God who are going down into the grave, is not su a sufficient rebuke to you and to me and others, please tell me what great evidence we can have that it is due. It is duty to unload and to be careful to walk circumspectly and not presumptuously. And Lord Brother Olsen, freshen up with periods of rest. And so, when we talk about temperance, it is not just temperance in eating. Gospel ministers have practiced in temperance in working, and they think it is not sin. But we are told it is sin, and it's not glory to God. Even though there is a work to be done, let us not think that God has called us to die on the field for overworking. Yes, when we receive the divine revelation, we have to go somewhere. Let us go. But the church thinking that it is work, the work of the minister, and this is where actually the pressure comes from. The, the church thinks that it is the duty of the minister to be on the road always. A little thing, the phone call to a minister. A little thing, go there and there. And a business matter or a financial issue, the minister is called. May we understand the work of the minister. May we understand also as a church, we have responsibilities to play and not load over the minister so that their families may be deprived of their comfort. And even the world itself may be deprived of their teachings when they are hurried into grave. And we say, uh, and we can sit um, back and say, Glory to God. This man died a martyr for the third angel working for the Lord. No, there is no glory to God when God has not sent you to do something, even though it is good and you overdo it and die. And so my appeal to fellow ministers, fellow teachers of the word and uh, fellow publishers like me who do the brain work, uh, I'm not an evangelist, I'm a publisher. My appeal is that um, let us freshen up also. Let us take a moment of reflection. And to the evangelists who are on the road always, I'm praying that uh, we may not preach the health message to others and not preach to, uh, to ourselves. And more so, I know we eat good in quotes. When I say we eat good, I mean that uh, we are trying to practice health reform. But then we miss the uh, principle of rest a lot. And so may God forgive us where we have thought that we were doing him glory when we were not doing him glory. And uh, may we continue learning and practicing that which we are learning. Shall we, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, it's never late to learn as still as Jesus Christ is um, our high priest, we can thank you because our probation has been extended. Help us, even if it is for doing good, that we may not overdo it, but we might practice temperance. You say that if you find honey, eat that which is to your fill and little. 
but do not overdo it. Sometimes we think that uh, dying for your work is what you have called us, when actually it is presumptuousness. Forgive us in this course, for this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.